uh, EECS and statistics at Berkeley and one of the leaders of the reinforcement learning theme. Martin. Hi, everyone. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Um, so let's open our slides. <clears throat> All right, so it's my pleasure to uh, give an overview of the theme on reinforcement learning for FODSI. Um, together with Deborah Bhatt Shaw at MIT, um, I'm a, a co-leader of this effort and we've got a range of people both from the East Coast and uh, Sorry the West to Coast. Martin, we, we're not seeing your slides. Okay, um, let's backtrack. Hmm. Can you see them now? We can. Yep. Perfect. Okay. So, um, sorry about that glitch. Um, <clears throat> so we've got a range of people both on uh, the East Coast and the West Coast. Um, so I think it's quite exciting, actually. Um, I've really enjoyed in getting ready for this talk. I've spent a bit of time reading other people's work. It's it's actually nice to have an excuse to uh, to read in a bit more depth the work of your colleagues. So what I'd like to do in this talk is just give an overview along with some highlights of uh, particular thrusts of work um, of different members of the team and also looking ahead to problems that are interesting, problems that we hope to work on um, as part of the FODSI effort. Uh, so very broadly, um, just a bird's eye view of reinforcement learning. Um, it's a very intellectually rich area. I've actually been interested in it for many years, just because it uh, combines so many different pieces. It has dynamics. You have a stochastic dynamical system with the notion of state, something evolving over time. Um, it has a notion of a reward or a cost function to minimize or reward function to maximize. So brings in decision-making um, into the loop. And the reinforcement part really closes the loop between learning and action. That's, this is the case where you typically don't know the model and you observe data in some form. So you need both to estimate the model to learn, but the model is just, is not the endpoint in itself. The endpoint, of course, is learning good policies that allow you to behave in interesting ways. So we have a picture here of David Blackwell um, a former colleague here at Berkeley, of course, did a lot of seminal work in the original formulations of um, MDPs, Markov decision processes, and so on. Just high level again, let me also say that um, in some ways it's appropriate that RL is last because it, it actually has very deep connections to a lot of the other FODC themes that we heard about today. Um, and I'll try and touch on these as we go through, certainly to causal inference, computational complexity, um, the economics learning thrust as well. Um, so I think there can be some fruitful inter interactions with these other themes. Um, in addition to being sort of mathematically very interesting, um, RL is also fascinating, particularly these days, because there's a very wide range of applications, um, ranging from things like digital health, robotics, industrial control, um, we've all heard about competitive game playing like chess and, and Go and so on, um, but also things like financial and economic systems, transportation networks. Um, in all of these uh, areas, um, models from reinforcement learning are, are proving useful and interesting to study. So let me just highlight um, one particular application of RL in which one of our team members, Susan Murphy, um, has been doing a lot of very nice work over over the past five to 10 years. And that's actually making reinforcement learning methods work for uh, personal health. Um, so here is a figure from one of her papers in which they're describing the uh, RL model that they've set up uh, to be loaded onto your cell phone um, in order to influence your behavior. It's trying to make you exercise more, in particular to take more steps. 
Um, but it's useful to understand because it has all the, the nice ingredients of a reinforcement learning problem. Um, you have a notion of time instance at which you collect information and make decisions. So here at the top, she's showing morning commute, lunchtime, mid-afternoon, and so on. Um, each day, there's five time instances. And in the study, there, there are many days. Um, you have a notion of state because um, unlike in the pure bandit setting, which we'll talk about later, their memory is important in these problems. So things like how many steps did you take in the past? Um, that matters. Your current location matter. How often you were using your phone matters. There's a whole list of observables here that form the state in this model. And the decision here is actually quite simple. It's just a binary action. Do they instruct the phone to give you an activity message or do they instruct the phone to do nothing? So states, actions, and then rewards. Rewards here are basically measured by how many steps you take in a half hour window after um, each message was sent. So obviously the algorithm is trying to maximize um, the number of steps. Um, so this is quite interesting and already quite challenging. Um, in their paper, they uh, talk about a number of the issues that I'll, I'll bring up later on. For instance, non-stationarity in this model. Um, there's computational issues already due to um, continuous states and so on. OK, so let me talk a little bit, um, again, just to wrap up the high level part. Um, the general thrust of, of this theme is, is to try and close a gap that I think it's fair to say exists in the current state of RL. Um, what we're seeing is you know, pretty tremendous empirical successes, but our current theory is kind of lagging. It, it's not really explaining what's going on in practice. Um, and it's important to close this gap, not just because we're theorists and we think that's interesting, but because in practice, because of issues like safety and so on, safety and stability of RL systems that would be rolled out uh, in the real world, for instance, imagine a self-driving car where people are trying to make uh, reinforcement learning work. If you don't have a good understanding of its failure modes, of its stability of policies and so on, um, this is not gonna work. This is gonna um, cause deaths. So somehow bridging this gap between uh, practice and theory is, is quite important. Um, so broadly, the theme has thrusts of bridging this gap, getting rigorous results on the RL methods that are used in practice, but at the same time also using theoretical insights to guide the development of new procedures. And um, connecting with some of the other thrusts in FODC, I think trying to understand various fundamental trade-offs that exist in reinforcement learning, for instance, between sample complexity, that just means how many samples do I need to learn, let's say, a, a epsilon good policy, uh, versus other resources that we might have, for instance, computational constraints, storage constraints, or if we're studying, for instance, multi-agent RL, we might have um, communication constraints um, linking to communication complexity that, that Roni was just talking about. Okay, so with that overview in place, let me, um, in the remainder of the talk, I'm going to pick a few directions and try and sketch out high level um, what are some challenges and also give some highlights of, of work that um, our team has been doing and intends to do uh, to address these challenges. So one issue here is that um, in many cases, if you look at how standard algorithms scale when applied to an unstructured reinforcement learning uh, problem, it's often prohibitive. It can be prohibitive in terms of sample complexity, how much data you need to learn. And it can be prohibitive, for instance, in terms of how it scales with the dimension of the problem, how it scales with the horizon of the problem, if you have a, a decision problem over some number of steps, or equivalently, how it scales with the discount factor, if you look at a, a discounted Markov decision process. Um, so an important direction here is to uh, propose models that have structure structure that's relevant in applications and also methods that exploit that structure and to prove things about these methods. Um, so a few lines of work um, here, I'm just again citing work 
by people that are a member of our team. I, just to be clear, many people are thinking about these problems. And so this is just specific to, to our team. Um, there's many kinds of structure that arise in applications. I'll, I'll talk about the LQR problem in a moment. Um, let me just mention briefly factored Markov decision processes. These are decision processes in which the state or decision variables somehow split into groups. Um, so very much connected to graphical models. And uh, where would factored MVPs arise? Um, well, an example from one of Suvrit Shra's paper would be if you have a robot, let's say a vacuuming robot that's making decisions about whether to clean or not, um, its decision about whether to clean a, a corner of the living room has nothing to do with the state of the kitchen table. Right? So you could imagine having a state that includes all parts of the house, but decisions and, and states would only interact in, in local ways. And that's exactly the idea of a factored MDP. Um, for problems where you have uh, continuous states, um, things become even more challenging just because of the usual curse of dimensionality. Um, and here you need structure like either some kind of smoothness um, you want your value function or your Q function to depend in a smooth way on your states and actions, or you need things like sparsity, um, low rank structure, and so on. So here, let me just highlight quickly some work that Devravat Shah and some of his um, collaborators have been doing on um, the classical Q learning algorithm, uh, one of the oldest algorithms in reinforcement learning. It's designed to try and learn the optimal uh, function that tells you the reward that you expect moving forward from a given state action pair. So they're studying a problem that has a continuous state and action space. And what they propose is by looking at it in a certain discretized form, they end up with a very large dimensional matrix. And by exploring the space, by trying out actions and from a given state trying out actions, you sort of partially populate the entries of this matrix. So it becomes what's known as a um, missing data problem or a um, matrix estimation problem with partially observed data. Um, they actually propose a new algorithm for this that would actually fill in the missing entries of the Q function. Um, they can then interpolate and then this loop starts again. So the key sort of ingredient here that they observe is that in practice, um, in many cases, Q functions, when you discretize them like this to form matrices, will have not exactly a low rank structure, but a near low rank structure. And when you have that kind of low dimensional structure, you can exploit it with an algorithm. Um, and they propose a particular algorithm that does exploit it. Um, what we're seeing here is the performance of their algorithm in terms of um, L infinity loss on the Q function versus the iteration number. And the line above is sort of a naive method. You can see it's very poor. It's converging. It's going to be consistent, but it's extremely slow. Whereas these algorithms down here are exploiting the structure. So you can see fairly dramatic speed ups by exploiting structure. Um, now, to be clear, there's still plenty of open questions here. Um, you can see actually the nuclear norm method seems to behave better, but nothing is known about it. They, they can't prove anything about it yet. And it's also much more computationally expensive. So there's various open questions um, that arise from this particular approach with low rank structure. Um, another vignette sort of structure or non-structure is the distinction between model free versus model based methods. Um, at a high level, model based algorithms in some way, try and estimate the dynamics of the underlying Markov chain. Whereas model-free algorithms are more direct, they go directly after what you care about, either the Q function or the policy or the value function. And you can say, well, which is better? And of course, the answer really is it depends. But trying to understand on what it depends and what are the trade-offs between these classes is, is quite interesting. Um, so here, let me talk briefly about another simple model, the linear quadratic regulator. Um, it's sort of a, a, the simplest instance of a continuous state and action reinforcement learning problem. You have a linear state space model with a quadratic reward function. So A here is the 
matrix that determines the dynamics of the Markov chain. Here, we'll just focus on the, the problem of evaluating the reward of a fixed policy. So the policy would also shape the form of this A. When you have a quadratic reward function, it's well known that the value function is a quadratic function of the state variable. So in this setting, you can have two very different approaches. The model-based approach says, well, let's observe transitions, xt, xt plus 1, and so on, and let's directly estimate the dynamics matrix. And then we can plug it into a Lyapunov equation to try and estimate the value function. OK, so that's model-based because it's very tied to the linear dynamics of the problem, whereas a model-free approach is, in, in some sense, um, less tied to dynamics. The only thing it exploits is that the value function is quadratic. So if you have a quadratic value function, um, you can do it's not exactly regression. It's a form of instrumental variables um, in the lifted quadratic space by looking at the functions of all the x's and then all the pairs of the x's. Um, that's uh, a linear function. A quadratic function becomes linear after this lifting. Um, what Tu and Rex showed actually is that if you look at the model-based approach that's shown here in blue and you compare it to the um, model-free approach, LSTD or LSPI, that's shown here in orange, um, in this case, LSTD is, is much more efficient um, this was the figure, I think, that sort of the empirical result that motivated their later theory. And what they ended up showing is that the model-free method actually requires, has a sample complexity, it requires a dimension D more samples than the direct method, the model-based um, method. Okay, so what it's telling you is that if you really believe that you have a linear state space model, it's much better to directly estimate the dynamics and then learn the value function from the learned dynamics. But of course, if you don't have complete faith in a linear state space model, then you might suspect that the model free approach is far more robust. Um, you can certainly construct many MDPs that have quadratic value functions, but do not have linear dynamics. So the model free approach would still work just fine in those cases. It's somehow much more robust to model the specification in the dynamics, um, whereas the plug-in model based approach would fail. But understanding these kinds of trade offs is, is quite interesting. OK, so a second direction that the team is very interested in has to do with the classic uh, exploration exploitation dilemma. Um, this is a dilemma that we're all familiar with, for instance, when you're exploring a new city, trying restaurants, or in my case, trying cafes for good coffee. Um, once you found a good, good cafe, do you just sort of hunker down there and stay there forever drinking their coffee? What if there's a better espresso somewhere else in the city? Maybe you should explore a little bit more. All right, so this is the classical trade-off that um, any kind of reinforcement learning algorithm encounters. And um, these kinds of trade-offs are now, I would say, relatively well understood in the classical bandit setting, just a, a classical multi-arm bandit. But there's a, a lot of open questions that arise in more complex settings. Um, a basic tool here that we heard about um, earlier today, for instance, uh, I think Mike mentioned it in his talk, is um, the notion of UCB, upper confidence bounds. And these basically just provide you a way of quantifying how uncertain are you about your current estimate of the rewards. Um, in my example earlier, how uncertain am I about my current estimate of the quality of this cafe's espresso? OK, so at every round, what these algorithms are doing are maintaining a combination of an empirical estimate of the reward, along with a confidence bound that reflects the fact that this is an empirical estimate. It's based on only a total of T of A samples. T of A is the number of times that you performed a particular action, A, in a total of T rounds. Um, so I should sort of hedge my bets. Maybe I just have a bad estimate of this coffee because I haven't consumed enough cups of it if coffee making or coffee drinking were somehow a, a noisy observation process. Okay, so this idea has proven uh, very powerful. 
And um, as I said, quite well understood in the, the standard bandit setting, there's been some thrusts of work uh, by different team members. Um, here's a snippet of work from Mike Jordan and some of his collaborators in which they take the Q learning algorithm. Uh, I mentioned this algorithm earlier and they studied in the context where you're actually exploring actively, you're sort of choosing actions and um, exploring the space. And they essentially propose to include a UCB bonus, an extra bonus in the classical Q function update. Um, and they study different forms of this, Hufting bonuses, Bernstein bonuses, and so on. And they prove a number of interesting results about how this can improve the dependence of these algorithms on the horizon. That's H, the number of steps that you take. Um, so that's one sort of interesting use of, of UCB. Um, another interesting use of UCB, and this is area in which uh, Devravat Shah and his collaborators have been involved, uh, is in the study of what's known as Monte Carlo tree search, um, MCTS for short. Um, it's a very clever idea, um, and it's a key ingredient of some of the modern successes of reinforcement learning, particular the AlphaGo system for, um, for playing Go uh, uses this technique heavily. And it's essentially a way of trying to estimate value functions from samples by rolling out a decision tree that tracks the states and actions that you make in a, in a sequence, forming a tree as we see here. Um, the bandit part comes in because the, um, <clears throat> this is an adaptive data collection procedure. So you can sort of think that at every node, you have a multi-arm bandit problem to solve. At each one of these nodes, there's a set of actions that I can take. And in exploring this tree to find the optimal path, I essentially need to solve a highly coupled sequence of multi-arm bandit problems. Um, so Devarat and his colleagues have, have done some, some theory on this, some nice theory trying to characterize exactly when this works um, and how it works. Um, a key difference is you actually have to use polynomial confidence um, bounds instead of typical logarithmic ones here. Okay, so there's, there's many future directions here. I, I think in the interests of time, I'll, I'll skip, but um, many interesting things that the team uh, plans to explore um, through this institute. So let me move on to our next direction. Um, our next direction has to do with getting instance optimal bounds in reinforcement learning. And here we're motivated by the, the classical fact that um, standard minimax bounds, these are various things that are proved are worst case in nature. Um, so most of the bounds I've quoted so far are worst case. For instance, saying that the scaling in the horizon is cubic, that's worst case. Uh, the fact of the matter is that many methods work far better in practice than the existing theory would suggest. Um, in fact, when I was sort of playing around with Q-learning, um, it, its worst case dependence on the horizon is cubic. Um, but if you want to construct a problem that actually achieves that, you have to work pretty hard. You can't just sort of construct a generic problem and get this worst case scaling. Most generic problems methods behave much, much better. Um, so what we'd like to do here is we'd like to obtain a finer grained characterization of the sample complexity and also computational complexity of RL methods. So let me give you a, a quick vignette um, in a very simple setting. So if we just look at the problem of estimating the value function of a policy in a discounted MDP. Okay, so in this setup, we have a, a function, the value function V star, and it satisfies Bellman's equation. It's equal to the reward plus the discount factor, the expectation of the value function for future states um, S primed conditioned on that state. Um, in the TD learning problem, we don't, we don't know the distribution E that's being used to compute expectations, but we get samples. And so we can compute noisy versions of this Bellman fixed point equation. Those are called temporal differences, hence the name TD learning. And TD learning is just a, a standard natural stochastic approximation algorithm. It says, well, if you had the right 
value function, then these differences would be zero mean, the random variables, but in expectation, they would be zero mean. So you should just push your policy, push your value function with small step sizes in that direction to make that zero. Okay, so that's a classical algorithm, one of the, the most widely used algorithms. And it can be improved with something known as polyak rupert averaging. Um, so there's lots known about the worst case behavior of TD learning, but what we focused on here is, is on a notion known as instance optimality. Um, and what does it mean to be instance optimal? Um, well, luckily statistics, uh, again, someone from Berkeley, Lacombe, gives us a very precise notion of what it means for a statistical procedure to be instance optimal. Um, Lacombe theory can be used to characterize the, um, at least asymptotically, the structure of the covariance matrix that an optimal method should achieve. And so if we look at that for this policy evaluation problem, it, it has a very natural form. Um, in the middle, you have the variance of the Bellman update. That's the update, the fixed point equation you're trying to solve. And on the left and the right, should be a transpose on one of these, um, you have I minus gamma, the discount factor times the transition operator of the Markov chain. Um, that sort of, if you invert, take um, the von Neumann series of that inverse, you're sort of taking powers of P. You're looking at all future transitions of the Markov chain. Um, so you can ask, well, does TD um, achieve this? And the answer is, like many questions, the answer is both yes and no. Um, if you do TD learning with polyak rupert averaging, that's um, a pretty standard device in stochastic approximation, um, it will achieve this bound asymptotically for very large sample sizes. But in modern practice, we look at finite sample sizes and we'd like to know, will the method actually be optimal for a finite sample size? Um, and this method's actually suboptimal. It's asymptotically optimal, but you can demonstrate for fixed T there are algorithms that strictly dominate this algorithm. And um, in our work, we actually proposed one such algorithm that is strictly better than, than TD learning. <clears throat> so some results from this paper, um, but in the interest of time, let me just move forward. <clears throat> so just to wrap up, let me talk about a last direction. Um, this one I think is, is very topical and it's also nicely connected with the causal inference thrust. Um, and this has to do with doing reinforcement learning in offline settings. So in an offline setting, um, you've collected data using one policy, let's call it the behavior policy that's been stored somewhere. And you'd like to use that data set to learn other things, possibly about other policies. Now, why would you like to do this? Well, for instance, imagine in, again, self-driving cars, if you have a new policy and you don't know whether it's safe or not or stable or not, you can't necessarily just roll it out in the real world to collect on policy data. Um, it's much better if you can have off policy data collected from a known and safe policy, and you can evaluate the performance of a new policy using the offline data. Um, so th this is a, a very active area, um, both in bandit world and in reinforcement learning. And there's many open questions here. Um, as I said, there are lots of connections with causal inference, things like instrumental variables, um, inverse propensity scores, doubly robust, me robust methods, synthetic controls. Um, these are all sort of standard ideas from causal inference that either have um, had impact already on offline RL or people are continuing to explore them. Um, I think the instance optimality questions here for these offline problems are, are wide open and very interesting to study. And another question that Susan highlights is often you want to select actions that are suitable for some kind of secondary data analysis. So for instance, she works a lot on clinical trials and so there you actually want to spend, it's very expensive to collect data and you want to do a lot of uh, post collection analysis of it. So they're interesting problems, actually interactions between how you collect the data that's going to become offline and what can be done with it after it's collected. 
So um, I'll wrap up there. Um, but thanks very much for your time. Thanks, Martin. So um, if there are any quick questions, um, now's your chance. Otherwise, um, let's say a big thank you to, to Martin and to all of the speakers today. Um, you know, it was a great collection of talks. Um, uh, and, you know, a reminder of the, the FODSI postdoc positions, uh, that advertisement, you can, you can find the details on the FODSI.us website. Um, so, you know, we're trying to get the word out there. Um, thanks a lot all for attending. That was um, a very, very fun event. Thank you. Thanks for organizing, Peter and Piotr. Of course.